Mistakes buying climbing gear can be deadly. So I'm gonna show you some of the most common ones and how you can avoid them. Buying climbing gear can be a stressful experience, regardless of whether you're an experienced climber or a newbie to the sport. I know personally, even I get confused from time to time, and I personally have made some monumental screw-ups over the years. In today's video, we're gonna be highlighting some of the classic mistakes climbers make when purchasing gear, so you can avoid making them. This will be everything from buying your first pair of climbing shoes to even some of the scarier and potentially deadly mistakes you can make. But before I continue any further, I just want to say a huge thanks to our sponsor for today's video, Edelrud. Edelrud have been my climbing gear sponsor for over a decade now, and in the climbing industry, they are renowned for quality, safety, and innovation. So without further ado, let's fix these mistakes. From the day I started climbing, I wanted to get high. And it wasn't long before I was looking at the lead wall and eager to buy my first rope. At the gear store, I can remember looking up at the numerous ropes on the wall and a sudden wave of confusion flooded over me as I realized I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. Different colors, brands, diameters and lengths. What was the difference between a dynamic and a static or a half rope and a twin rope? I had no idea. But with my youthful exuberance, I grabbed a slick looking pink rope from the rack. It was lightweight and I thought, you know what? Nobody would mess with a guy with a pink rope. When I tried to pay, the guy stopped me. He had seen this before. I was planning to use it for indoor lead climbing, to which he politely told me that the seven millimeter half rope was probably not ideal. So instead, he pointed me at a 10 millimeter creamy colored Bial rope that he told me it was what is referred to in the industry as a single rope. But what would have happened if I bought the half rope? Well, I'd have taken it to the climbing wall and try climbing with it. Climbing on half ropes isn't bad, but you're supposed to use two of them together, not on their own. I mean, it's more than likely that if I'd have taken a fall, my bilier might not have been able to arrest the fall quite as easily as if I'd been using a single rope. Most standard double bilier devices can handle the thin diameter of a half rope. However, it's worth noting that classic automatic devices such as Grigri's are not rated for their thin diameter and so might not easily catch the rope. So that was my mistake. For all sport climbing and indoor climbing needs, a single rope is what is needed. When you're in the store, look for these symbols. A single rope looks like this, a half rope looks like this, and a twin rope looks like this. If you're still in doubt, look online at the manufacturer's recommendation or ask a member of staff in store. Another classic mistake when buying your first rope is accidentally buying a static rope instead of a dynamic one. It's a pretty easy mistake to make, especially when buying online, because static ropes are usually much cheaper than dynamic. <clears throat> you can think you're getting a great deal, but actually you're purchasing a one-way ticket to the emergency room. Static ropes are designed for industry use only, i.e. rope access, rigging, etc. They are not designed for taking falls on. Dynamic ropes are designed to have some bounce in them so that when you take a fall, much of the force of the fall is taken out by the rope stretching. God forbid you take a leader fall onto a static rope. The rope won't snap, but because the rope doesn't stretch, the arrest of your fall will be very sudden, potentially leading to serious injuries. The good news is that static and dynamic ropes are pretty easy to tell apart. Static ropes are generally either black or white or white with black markings on them whereas dynamic ropes tend to be a lot more colorful. This isn't always the case, but it can help in identifying them from appearance. Also, static ropes feel stiffer and won't handle as well as a dynamic. So if a rope feels quite stiff, best to avoid it. The surest way to find out though, is just by reading the description on them online. And it should say whether or not it's dynamic or static. If you've already bought it though, then the tag at the end of the rope should give away some clues. If it has any of the dynamic rope markings I mentioned earlier, such as single, half, and twin, then you'll know it's not a static rope. If you're still unsure, don't test it, and instead, seek help at a climbing gym or a gear store. If I haven't already given you enough to think about, the last thing to watch out for is how long or short your rope is. I was always told size doesn't matter. 
Guess in climbing it does. <laughs> Catch my drift. <laughs> Everyone has heard the dreaded tales of being lowered off the end of a rope. A friend of mine did this in France many years ago and had to crawl back to the car when he shattered both his ankles. But this isn't just something that happens at crags. It also happens at gyms. And it's a terrifying image to imagine seeing the rope slipping through the belay device and the climber plummeting to the ground. But it's quite an easy thing to avoid. All you have to do is find out the length of the crag or wall you're climbing at. If it's a 30 meter high wall, you'll need a 60 meter to climb up and get lowered back down. If it's any more than 30, you'll need either a 70 meters or 80 meter rope. Most climbing walls will be okay with a 50 meter rope, but a few require 60 meter ones. So make sure you don't get caught out if you climb a really tall lead wall. The best way to find out is by checking the guidebooks or online topos, or if you're in the gym, just ask the instructors. And guys, always tie a knot in the end of your rope. It's easy to do, and if for any reason you accidentally get on a route that is longer than you expected, you won't be lowered off the end of your rope. Climbing gear is expensive, and it can be really tempting to look online for the best deals on secondhand gear. For many items, this is totally reasonable, but you do need to be careful because no cheap deal is worth your life. Secondhand gear is always gonna have a question mark over it. What has it been used for? Where has it been stored? I mean, you can't ever be 100% certain, and often sellers don't even know themselves if their old gear is still safe to use. When it comes to buying secondhand gear, the one thing I just wouldn't touch is anything soft, such as ropes, slings, and harnesses, even quick draws, as the slings between the carabiners can be compromised. The gruesome consequences of any of these pieces of gear failing is hard to stomach, but worth thinking about when considering secondhand gear. If a rope has been left in a damp shed for a long time, perhaps next to chemicals or even somewhere relatively dry, but in direct sunlight, these can all cause invisible damage that drastically reduces the strength of the materials and could compromise your safety when used for climbing. For that reason, I think it's fair enough to just buy all that gear brand new, as then you can be 100% certain its history is accounted for by the manufacturer. On the other hand, hardware like carabiners, belay devices, cams, nuts, really anything with metal without the use of textiles is generally okay to purchase secondhand. You can tell pretty quickly if it's compromised as any damage will be visible. Years ago, I heard about a thing called micro fractures. The idea being that if you dropped a carabiner from a short height, tiny micro fractures would appear that are invisible and would drastically affect the integrity of the steel. This, to the best of my knowledge, was proven to be false in all climbing gear from the late 70s onwards. Metal hardware is 99% of the time bomber, unless you can see notable damage in the exterior. In the World Wide Web, there's a lot of dodgy people doing dodgy dealings. Whoa, don't look at me. I'm just an honest Joe trying to make my way in the world. But seriously, I've heard more than one story lately of people buying dodgy gear from dodgy websites, which leads to some scary situations. The main thing to be sure of when purchasing gear is that it's rated for climbing use because believe it or not, there is stuff out there that looks like climbing gear in every way with the one exception that it is not for use whilst climbing. One great example of this is the carabiner keychain. Looks like a carabiner, but most of them usually have a big stamp on them saying not for use climbing. If you made the terrible mistake of using one of these, it's highly likely that it would snap under the load of a leader fall. But these aren't the only things to look out for. Online shops like Wish are rife for producing all sorts of things like climbing harnesses and climbing ropes that shouldn't be climbed with. It might be cheap, but is that price tag worth your life? Not a chance. There's a reason why climbing gear is expensive, and that's because it does a pretty amazing job. It stops you from cratering into the ground when you fall off. And part of the process of producing climbing gear is getting each piece of gear rated for climbing. The UIAA sets safety standards for climbing gear companies to meet in order to sell their products as safe to use climbing equipment. 
So next time you're looking for any new piece of gear and you're unsure whether it's safe to use or not, check to see if it is accredited by the UIAA, as then you can be sure that what you're buying meets the highest standards. Without a doubt, the most common climbing gear perching mistake is buying shoes that are too small for you. This happens to both beginners and experienced climbers alike. We never learn. Every new climber is told by their climbing friends that climbing shoes need to be tight and tend to be uncomfortable. This leads new climbers into purchasing shoes that don't feel good on their feet, which means they don't like wearing them, which means they end up not liking climbing as a result because all they remember of climbing is pain. We've been here for half an hour. The shoes aren't going on. They are two sizes too small. And even if they did go on, they would cripple you. You don't want that, do you? <laughs> Bottom line, as a beginner climber, it doesn't really matter if the shoe is a little bit big. If it's comfy, you'll enjoy climbing in it. And when you get more experience, you can buy a tighter pair of shoes for performance. But even as an experienced climber, we still make the same mistakes. I've met so many climbers who've seen a deal online for a shoe they really want, but it's a half size smaller than they usually go. They say to themselves, I'll, I'll make it work. I'll stretch them. I'll wear them in the bath for an hour and they'll mold to my foot. What happens more than not is they waste the money on a shoe they never wear because it's just too painful. You'd have saved money by just buying the right size. And of course, buying shoes online can seem a little daunting if you don't know the shoe fits your feet. But remember, any good web store should allow you to send them back if they didn't fit, providing you haven't climbed in them and all the packaging is still intact. So if you are purchasing shoes online, check to make sure the online store has a returns policy, policy and if it does, just send back the shoes for a bigger pair instead of trying to crush your feet into them, which we all know never ends well. If you do want to know more about fitting climbing shoes as well as identifying what type of shoe is best for you, I have some brilliant guides on my channel, which I'll link to above. Climbing gear is expensive and nobody expects you to start climbing and instantly have all the gear for every eventuality. But so many climbers make the mistake of investing thousands in shiny bits of metal they won't ever actually use. You don't want to buy for what you might need in the next five years. Instead, purchase what you can for now and borrow the rest. And trust me when I say this, it's better this way. If you buy everything from the get-go, you end up making some big mistakes. Perhaps you realize that you don't really need that size of cam, or you prefer another brand instead. If you go slowly and get what you like, you usually get to test your friend's gear first before you buy, and you get to know your gear really well to the point that they become as familiar to you as friends, and you know exactly how and when to use them. And if all your friends are new to climbing, then maybe consider chipping in together to have a shared collection of gear. I mean, it's actually really common for things like bouldering mats and trad racks, as it's all pretty expensive. It's only too common to see what the pros are using and want that, because if it works for them, surely it'll work for you. But it's a bit like saying, I'm gonna buy a Mercedes Formula One car because Lewis Hamilton wins races in them. So it'll be great for me going down to the shops. And just like Formula One, a lot of the specialist gear pro climbers use and often promote is suited to the type of climbing they are doing. I heard that after free solo, sales of TC Pros and climbing gyms skyrocketed because that was the shoe that Alex Honnold wore. But guys, TC Pros suck at indoor climbing. <gasps> For that reason, it's important to really investigate what you need the gear for and whether it would be a good purchasing decision or just a whim because you saw some pro climber climbing hard in it. But don't let that put you off looking at what the pros use because they know their gear better than anyone. Find out why they use that piece of gear and if it suits what you're doing, go for it. And something one of the designers at Edward told me years ago that stuck with me. 
was that the research and development that goes into producing the higher end products is how they learn of new technologies and achieve breakthroughs that make the rest of their product range that much better. So the next time you see a pro climber using a bit of gear, ask yourself, do you really need it? And will it help you climb better? Remember that most brands have a wider range of products to suit every level and every situation. And just because the pros use one thing in particular doesn't mean it's right for you. I hope that was helpful, guys. We've all made terrible mistakes when buying gear. I've shared a couple of mine. Was there any I missed? Feel free to share away your big mistakes below in the comments. And as always, like, subscribe, and ding that wee bell for notifications when our next video is out. Peace.